One of my favorite feelings is climbing into my bed when it has freshly laundered sheets. I didn't think it could get much better until I tried Caraloha sheets. Caraloha is the original for luxuriously soft and sustainable bedding, bath, and apparel made from bamboo viscose. Caraloha's commitment to sustainability starts at the source right out of the ground and it extends all the way to your home and back again. It's a comfy way to save the planet. I love my Caraloha sheets and when I first got them, I couldn't believe how cute the reusable box they came in was and how amazingly soft the sheets were. Not only are bamboo sheets twice as soft as cotton, but they also stay three degrees cooler than non-bamboo sheets. Whether you're buying a gift or treating yourself, you can't go wrong with luxurious, super soft and sustainable Caraloha sheets. Caraloha is giving our listeners 25% off their order by using code RAIN. This code doesn't last forever, so hurry and head to C-A-R-I-L-O-H-A.com and use code RAIN to receive 25% off your order. How I love fall, the comfy clothes, the holidays are coming, and best of all, it's the changing of the drinks. After a summer filled with iced coffees and slushies, I am ready for Spanish coffees and hot toddies. And now that I am home after a day of pumpkin patching and scarf wearing, I couldn't be happier to be sitting by the fire, bra and shoe free. Okay, a little drink might make me even happier. Oh my God, I don't have any liquor. Oh, this is horrible. The last thing I wanna do is go back into the world. But wait, I can use Drizzly, duh. Drizzly not only has beer, wine, and spooky season-appropriate spirits, but best of all, they deliver, so I can responsibly enjoy my adult beverages without leaving the house. Okay, so let me just go to drizly.com and, oh, put in my email for $5 off. Sweet. Okay, now my order. Blah, 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 blah. A done so. My drinks are on the way, and they're going to be here in less than an hour? Wow, that was easy. Oh, cool. If they don't deliver directly to me, then the alcohol will be shipped to my house in just a couple of days. Mm, While I'm here, I think I'll gift Emily some wine. That'll be a nice little surprise to come home to after a hard day at work. So if you're feeling too cozy to venture out to buy your alcoholic beverages, then visit drizzly.com and choose from their wide variety of wine, beer, and spirits and have the drinks brought to you. Drizzly.com. Beer, wine, and liquor delivered to your doorstep. Today's episode originally aired on our Patreon. We'll be back with brand new episodes soon. Thank you for your patience as Josh heals from heart surgery. This is Murder in the Rain, where each week Emily Rowney, Alicia Holland, and Josh McCullough tell true crime stories of the Pacific Northwest. Murder in the Rain contains graphic content Listener discretion is advised. While we wish we could all be permanently brave, a lack of fear can be dangerous on its own. In 2015, a woman who went by SM did an interview with the NPR podcast Invisibilia. She explained that due to her extremely rare condition of Urbach-Weiss disease, she doesn't feel fear. Part of Urbach-Weiss disease is that your brain develops calcium deposits. SM's just so happened to develop in the part of her brain that processes fear. As an artist, SM struggles to create art inspired from fear as she has lost any concept of it. Almost like the face of a long-gone loved one, SM can't remember what the feeling or concept of fear is. Because she has no fear, she can't judge the danger of certain situations. Once she was walking through a park when a man on a bench summoned her over. She walked right over and had a seat. And that's when the man grabbed her by her shirt and held a knife to her neck. Even that and his verbal threat to cut her couldn't initiate fear. So she responded, go ahead, cut me. I'll hunt your ass. Wow. Can you imagine like being the perpetrator in that scenario? It's like, uh, ma'am. She said that it was her response to him that 
got made him. it stop because he was probably like well, what he the just shit let her go it's like whoa okay do you know if that disease can like it can be in any part of your brain yeah. you could develop imagine the possibilities yeah. i'm gonna go on a spiral on that Please later do. and the other aspect of it is a husky voice Ooh, isn't that an interesting combo she would be a cool friend to have she would probably push you to try new things you know well i don't know if it'd be the safest friend but it should be a fun vacation, pal. That's Tell you true. What. Yeah. Shark All diving. the excursions. Yeah. Heck yeah. And that is just one of the two times that she has had a knife pulled on her. And she has twice been held <gasps> at gunpoint. No way. <laughs> so it's not that she's stupid and purposefully putting herself in dangerous situations. It's the lack of fear that allows her to walk places most of us would reconsider or to approach strangers. On the plus side of all of this is that because of her not feeling scared, she does not suffer from PTSD or trauma. She's literally unfazed. This is so interesting because it's almost like uh, sociopaths where yeah. you would have to train yourself to recognize situations like they have to train their emotions. Yeah, like, side. oh, yes, we're happy at the birthday party. Right. Yay. She has to literally memorize, OK, these are the types mm -hmm. of situations that I should avoid to not get shanked. Like you wouldn't naturally have that gut feeling like I should cross the street or I, sh you know, that guy is looking at me weird. That that's intense. And then you would basically not feel tension in wow. that in that regard. Stress free. Imagine. <laughs> well, it's funny because I don't feel um, nervousness like other people. I don't mm -hmm. I don't get nervous before anything uh, the way people explain it to me. And I always thought. It was something off about mm -hmm. my personality or something. But I realized later it just manifests differently. Mm. But yeah, I don't feel like apprehension to do public speaking right. or, or meeting new people. Or The only thing that I can possibly relate to is is how in my first job I hated having to call people on the phone. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, maybe that was nervousness. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but wow, to not feel fear, that's insane. Yeah, it's like you would never not pursue things or like i'm gonna ask that person out because what, gonna what's gonna write happen? that book I'm you gonna... have no concept of the yeah. consequence yeah. of doing it it's I bet really she gets fascinating paid high there's no wage gap for her right you know, wow yeah i need a little bit of that just a little bit just yeah just just a dash while sm's lack of fear might get her killed can those of us that feel fear be scared to death and can the one causing the fear be charged Pay attention, Josh, because you're always scaring me in the house. Ooh, I have an anecdote for the discussion. Ooh. First, let's talk about the science of being scared. When you're scared, you experience a surge of hormones, primarily adrenaline. The moment of fear elicits your flight, fight, freeze, or fawn responses. Your heart rate increases, your blood pressure and glucose levels rise. All of this causes a little zap in the electrical system of your heart. All of that in small doses can be fun too much and it can be lethal don't forget your butthole Gwen <laughs> have you ever been so scared and your butthole does that yes <laughs> pucker, pucker up clenches I think I, that, I did that once and it like hurt <laughs> like I, I could feel that in my heart so it was like <laughs> <laughs> all yeah. your muscles in your body clench yeah. just slapped closed all suddenly you had a up. suddenly you had a six pack <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all the blood went to my abs and my anus. You could hear your or you could feel your heart in your butthole. <laughs> it was September 26, 2008, when 20 year old Quantarius McCoy and his friend and co conspirator, 20 year old Larry Whitfield, decided to rob a bank. Heading to Gastonia in North Carolina, they entered the Fort Financial Credit Union. Armed with a loaded 357 revolver and an assault rifle, they had hoped the weaponry would make the robbery go smoother. However, their attempt failed and the two young men fled the scene. Leaving the bank, they switched getaway cars and started heading east, hoping to make the 20 or so miles into the city of Charlotte. On their way, they were spotted by some of the many police that were looking for them. They only made it 10 miles to the city of Belmont before their plan started to fall apart. With the young men panicking behind the wheel, a pursuit ensued, leading to the robbers hitting a car on the I-85, causing their own to break down. Hoping to make a getaway on foot, they abandoned their car on the shoulder of the exit ramp, grabbed their guns, and headed into a neighborhood, hoping to get lost in the houses, fences, and streets. As they started to make a run for it, the duo split up while tossing their weapons. Larry Whitfield found an empty house to hide out in, but it didn't stay empty for long. 
When the owner came home, she was greeted by Larry and the knife he began threatening her with. Terrified, the woman fled, getting away safely. Larry might have been stupid, but he wasn't an idiot. He knew the police would be coming to that home any second now that she had gotten away. So Larry also ran out of the house and into a second one. This time it was the home of 79-year-old Mary Parnell. Mary was home alone. Presumably using the knife again, he forced Mary to move into another bedroom in the house. At the same time, Larry started making phone calls, desperately seeking a friend that could come pick him up from the new location. The terror of having an intruder in her home, forcing her into other rooms, which could have led to who knows what kind of assault, Mary's heart couldn't handle the adrenaline and electricity accompanying that fear, and she suffered a heart attack, leading to her death. She had literally been scared to death. On November 23, 2009, a verdict was returned at the end of Larry's six-day trial. He was found guilty of attempted robbery of the credit union, conspiracy to possess, carry, and use firearms during an attempted robbery, and the accompaniment of Mary, resulting in her death. He was found responsible for her death as his actions violated the United States Supreme Court forced accompaniment statute. The statute allows for a range of sentences for this kind of scenario, from 10 years to life. The law pertained to Larry's situation specifically as he was in the midst of a bank robbery. Much like how a bank robber might force the people in the bank to move to another room, he had done the same thing. It just happened to be in someone's house, not at the bank, but the law still applied. An error was made in his original sentencing, but in November of 2012, a judge corrected those errors, making the sentence concurrent. With 240 months for the attempted robbery and firearms, running concurrently with 264 months for the forced accompaniment. In addition to those 22 years, he would then serve another 60 months for another firearms conviction. In all, the 20 year old will be serving 27 years. Wow. His co robber, Quantarius McCoy, pleaded guilty, earning himself seven years behind bars. While there are documented reports, such as Mary's, of people being scared to death, it is not very common. Medical experts have found that since we are no longer experiencing the same fears as our ancestors, such as being hunted by a predator, our flight, fight, freeze, fawn responses can almost be too intense for situations that trigger it. With potentially large amounts of fear hormones, the most affected organs, such as the lungs and heart, can suffer from an overdose. In every case of being scared to death, it comes down to the condition of the heart at the time. Everyone that has died from fright was already dealing with a heart condition, whether they knew it or not. According to Scientific American and their interview with Martin A. Samuels, chairman of the neurology department at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, this is what happens when you're scared. Adrenaline from the nervous system lands on the receptors of the heart muscle cells, and this causes calcium channels in the membranes of those cells to open. Calcium ions rush into the heart cells, and this causes the heart muscle to contract. If it's a massive, overwhelming storm of adrenaline, calcium keeps pouring into the cells, and the muscles just can't relax. There is this specifically adapted system of muscle and nerve tissue in the heart, the sinotrial node and the antrioventricle node, and the Purkinje fibers, which sets the rhythm of the heart. If this system is overwhelmed with adrenaline, the heart can go into abnormal rhythms that are not compatible with life. If one of those is triggered, you will drop dead. (laughs) When it comes to your heart, fear isn't the only intense emotion that can stop it. We've talked about broken heart syndrome before. Then there's my grandma, who I talk about at length on Always Be My Sisters, about how she died after having sex with my grandpa while they were both in their (laughs) 80s. Large events can cause it, too such as the German study that found there was an increase of heart-related deaths when Germany was in the World Cup. And for a week following 9-11, there was an increase of heart attack-related deaths in New York. While Mary's case, being in her late 70s, probably having a pre-existing heart condition, seems like a one-off, take caution this Halloween season. Dr. Samuels warns that while having a heart condition would naturally raise your risk to being susceptible to death by fear, it can strike anyone of any age, at any time. On that note, I have a story. I'd love to hear it. Keep in mind, this is from Grandma Betty, who likes to tell a story. (laughs) So my grandmother is from New Brunswick, and she spent a lot of her time on Prince Edward Island. And she told me this story when I was in my teens, and I can't recall if it was like 
someone prior to her time in her town or if it happened when she was a kid. She, My memory serves me that she might have been a kid when this happened. So the story goes that, you know, there's this nice little farmland and there was this family that lived on this area behind a um, cemetery. So the little girl ha- would go berry picking. You'd have to walk through the cemetery to get to the berry picking. Well, one day when she went to Did go she do call that, it the Sima berry, she should have. Well, on one day on her way to do that and come back, she didn't return. So they went looking for her and they found her dead near the cemetery. So they bury her and they have a funeral where, well, her mother uh, woke up one night with this horrible dream that the girl wasn't dead and was in her coffin alive trying to get out. So she went to the town and threw up such a scene that they decided to dig her up. And when they dug her up, there were claw marks in the (gasps) coffin that she, like, to the bone trying to get her way out. And she died due to fear of being in a coffin, waking up in a coffin. And I think later they determined she had that rare disorder where you look like you're dead because your heart (gasps) beat is so slow. But can you imagine... Wow. And the whole time her mom was right and everyone thought she was crazy when she's like, I don't think she's dead. And then that dream, she's just had to go find out. Right. But I don't know if it's true or not. Well, but, still, but it happens. Right. Saved by the bell is why we have that. Like, Oh, yeah. It, we, uh, people uh, were safety buried. coffins. Yep. Safety coffins were a big thing. Oof. And if you don't know what a safety coffin is, it's because so many people were buried when they were actually alive that they built special coffins to to make sure that that didn't happen. So some of them had a window in the top with like a pole that went up to the to the surface so you could look in and see their face. Others would put put you in morgues. They'd tie a bell to your toe. That's what saved by the bell yeah. uh, in your both your coffin and in the morgue. Very interesting stuff. Yeah. But yeah, it, it happened a lot. And I love that my grandma would tell me that story. I don't yeah, know what her intent <laughs> was to try to get me scared or what, but it's a good one. I'm curious your thoughts on his sentencing because he got 27 years. Now... Number one, he's 20, so he's an idiot. He was in the wrong to be in anyone's house. Wasn't going there to murder. I think, yes, it's the circumstance. But it at any given moment, if you kill someone accidentally, it's manslaughter, right? Yeah. I think he probably should have had a lesser a lesser charge. But compared to, with, or paired with all of the things that he did, right. it does not surprise me. And yes, I think that. It's it served him well. Also, like I think it was fascinating that they were able to use that law that had been created mm-hmm. for bank robberies. You know, you can't use a gun to but move you someone had, into the into you the had vault. robbed something. So they were just trying to get him on everything they could. Yeah. Which I mean, it's I appreciate. kind of genius. I think it's I mean, that's not my family member. Mm-hmm. I personally feel like that's a really extreme sentence for someone so young and also uh that wasn't the intent. They were like, we're going to go in I don't, and kill this lady. But I lady. don't put that at the same level of someone getting like busted with a little bit of weed and going to jail for their life. You know what I mean? Like he oh, chose yeah, no, to no, do no. those I things. Oh, yeah, no, no, no. I mean, yeah, he broke in. It, they're, yeah, he broke in. He had weapons. He tried to rob a bank. He was not making good choices. And everything is a higher charge when there is a weapon involved. So yeah. 27 years like seems on the nose for me. Yeah. Obviously, because I'm me, my plates are expired. Um, but with COVID and everything, it's been Alicia I Holland. Know, can you believe it? Alicia Joy Holland. <laughs> but even my license is expired because I've been trying to get an appointment at the DMV and all that. And then I had this thought in my head of like, if I get pulled over and get a ticket, but then I can't get into the DMV, I'd be so pissed. But then it, I, I took a step back and was like, but where does the fault or where does the fault lie? And it's with me because my plates is expired before COVID happened. And so that's on oh, me. Oh, oh, I'm always. You think I remember to call in via to do that? All you have to do is answer by email and they mail them now. No, I have to go in because I have to get a new license. Oh. So even that part I can't. But so it's just it kind of made me think of this case because here I am like I'd be pissed at the cop for giving me a ticket when if you rewind, rewind. So then I kind of thought of her because I'm like. Yes, he had a hand in your death because of the fear he was causing. But also, if you're coming into a situation with a pre-existing heart condition, how much fault goes to him? No, no, no. It is all him because he entered your property. Oh, I know that. I'm just saying the combination of things. Like, it's just interesting to 
it, it's almost like the guy that breaks into your house and falls on the knife, mm. you know, and then it's and like, then you're the one. That, yeah, yeah. Like uh, the knife was here. So it's mm. just I had a class in high school where they talked about someone's house kept getting burglarized. Mm-hmm. So he set up a oh, trap yeah. and killed the guy and yeah. then he went to jail for it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, but this, so it's not. I it's see not what you're just, saying, but I don't think it applies for him. It's like not. It's not to take away or to say that it was her fault. It's just an interesting combination to have that happen and lead to that. To where if it had been someone else, Healthy. let's say it was that first woman, and she was really young and didn't have a heart condition, and then he was just like, "I just got to get out of here," and he leaves in his friend's car. She'd be fine. Yeah, wh- you know, then maybe he gets a kidnapping charge. It's more like the universe works in weird yeah. ways. But yeah, I mean, he made the decision to do crime and then enter her home and yeah. do that. And it's it's sad. It sucks. You know, a young person makes him a, one. And he probably made more mistakes. Well, he made a lot of mistakes. Did it. Even just that day, he made a lot but of say mistakes. say he never committed a crime before that. What right. a day. Yeah. What a crime spree. Yeah. And then, you know, 27 years, you're going to think about it every day. And yeah. that sucks. But that's the way the cookie crumbles. Mm-hmm. Don't well, do yeah, crime. Well, yeah, because the flip side of that is if I'm the family member going, she was fine. And if you hadn't entered the home, mm-hmm. she'd be fine. Yeah, they, you know? they could too. Yeah. You know, so he could. Anyway, so I, I kind of liked playing both sides of that of just where do you assign uh, responsibility or percentage of res- responsibility based on full picture. But of it's things, like so. not being insured and hitting another yeah. cart. Say they were in the wrong. You're still the one to blame because you're not insured. And that yeah. sucks. Uh, but that happens. Yeah. So. Anyway, so it's a it's a fascinating case how they use the law and the fact that she mm. died from fright, which is so abnormal. But Halloweeny. I mean, that'd be kind of a a good way to go, and if if it was something fun and yeah, Halloween I'd rather related, I'd not love someone to breaking go into your house, doing it when I'm eighty, or just being so scared, or just like thrill seeking, like yeah, how fun. So be careful out there this Halloween. We don't want anybody's heart given out. With some good scares. And it's a perfect year to go as like Bane or a ninja and wear that mask, <laughs> That's y'all. right. Keep that face covered if you're going outside. And if not, stay home and have a great little party on your own. Be careful and be scareful. <laughs> That's copywritten right now. I recently started adding the good stuff to my morning routine so that I could have more energy and healthier skin and hair. The good stuff is a superfood powder that can be added to any beverage. Whether you like a morning coffee, tea, or protein shake, one scoop of the good stuff powder enhances your drink, helps to promote focus, fights inflammation, and if I might say so, it tastes pretty great. I love a good superfood and it's typically the first thing I put in my body each day. The good stuff is different from all the rest. When I opened the package, it was like fall finally arrived. I couldn't tell if it smelled more like apple cider or cinnamon coffee cake, but either way, it smelled great. Four wellness products are made with only the good stuff and none of the bad, like artificial ingredients, creamers, or sweeteners. They're specifically designed to be easy to integrate into everyday routines because Four Wellness believes feeling great shouldn't come at the expense of taste or convenience. You can get 20% off your order, plus free shipping and a free starter kit worth over $30 for a limited time when you visit forwellness.com slash podcast. That's F-O-R-W-E-L-L-N-E-S-S dot com slash podcast and enter code RAIN at checkout. This is For Wellness's best offer right now, so don't wait. Order today. They're so sure that you'll see the benefits of adding the good stuff to your coffee that they back every purchase with a 60-day money-back guarantee. If you're not completely satisfied, you can return it for a full refund. When a newlywed couple is involved in a fender bender, the task of exchanging information becomes one of dodging bullets, and what would have been a crash investigation becomes a murder investigation, and the police work, or lack thereof, would end up determining the fate of the killer. Today, I'll be telling the story of Manbir Kajila, Samandeep Gill, and the importance of following protocol with Section 490. Located in British Columbia as part of the Vancouver metro area is the city of Surrey, 
In 2011, there were 7,280 violent crimes out of the population of nearly half a million. Out of those, 12 were homicides, 10 were attempted murders. On April 27, 2011, one of those homicides and attempts took place. On that Sunday evening in spring, newlyweds Pava Sangira Kajila and her husband Manbir Singh Kajila were driving down 128th Street, just north of 68th Avenue. Now, when I say newlyweds, I mean new. Not only had they just had their ceremony in India seven weeks prior, but the couple's Canadian ceremony took place the morning of the 27th. 128th Street has four lanes, but the set of two lanes for each direction are separated by a large shrub-adorned median. For as wide as it is, the street is residential, upper-middle-class homes on either side. The neighborhood is one of families, some homes multi-generational. It's a quiet place, not often disturbed by much. That night, the disturbance came in form of a fender bender. Around 11 p.m., Manbir was behind the wheel of his Lexus IS250 headed southbound in the right lane, a white SUV in the left. It was noted the SUV had been driving erratically when suddenly it came into the right lane, causing damage across the right side of the SUV and to the front side of the Lexus. Stopping in the road, Manbir approached the driver. Reports are conflicting, but it's believed Pava also exited the Lexus and approached the SUV. Before either could make contact, shots were fired and bullets came flying towards the newlyweds. Bang, 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 bang. Running away, Manbir was struck by at least one of the five bullets. Once shot, he collapsed on one of the beautifully manicured lawns of the quiet neighborhood, in pain and dying. Pava got back in her car as the SUV with the shooter sped off. Calls to 911 were made around 11.05 p.m., Police and paramedics arrive to find Manbir alive but struggling. There's even a disturbing news video showing their attempts at CPR as he lay on the lawn and the use of a breathing pump as they loaded him into the ambulance. As hard as they tried, their efforts were fruitless. Manbir, the 30-year-old husband, was pronounced dead on arrival at the hospital. 25-year-old Pava was unharmed but traumatized. Interviewed by police, Pava was able to provide them with a description a South Asian or Indo-Canadian young man driving an older white SUV. She had seen him but didn't recognize him. Desperate to find a motive, investigators dug into Manbir and Pava's private lives, searching for any criminal connections. Was this young couple into drugs? Gangs? Did they owe anyone money? Again, there are conflicting reports that Manbir had several DUIs on his record, but one report claimed that that was a different person, but they had the same name. And this Manbir had zero criminal history. Either way, the most trouble he had been in, if that was him, was a DUI. No matter how deep they dug, investigators could find no connection between Manbir and Pava and the driver. So they had to come up with other theories. Was this a road rage situation? Had they been in an accident and maybe the other driver was furious or maybe they had already had an interaction on the road, which then escalated? Was this gang related or just a crime of opportunity? With no motive, barely a description of the shooter and vehicle, the case went cold. For seven years, there wasn't much new in Manbeer's case. In 2016, the case was handed over to the B.C. Provincial Unsolved Homicide Unit after it went cold under the care of the Integrated Homicide Investigation Team, or IHIT. Eventually, with developments in technology and a thorough investigation, including canvassing, surveillance, and forensics, an arrest was made. It was May 5, 2018, when 30-year-old Samandeep Gill was charged with not only the second-degree murder of Manbir, but the attempted murder of Pava. After their investigation to find this needle in a haystack, detectives finally learned the motive for the killing, and it was the most upsetting answer. This had merely been a random act of violence. Though the investigation had gone quiet publicly, there had been warrants issued and more was learned about the investigation process once the arrest was made. I was unable to find reasoning, perhaps that's a Canadian legal thing or a media thing, but somehow detectives had found Salmon Deep back in 2011 and he had been a suspect all along. Perhaps there were surveillance videos or witnesses that led the team to Salmon Deep's home, where they found a white 2004 Toyota 4Runner. Obtaining search warrants, IHIT went to his home on May 14th and 15th, 2011, just weeks after the shooting. 
Besides a vehicle matching the description, officers found and seized multiple telecommunication devices, including iPhones and Blackberries. They also took a home surveillance system. It was later learned there had been a video of Samandeep departing from his residence in the white SUV about an hour before the shooting. After confiscating the phones and getting records, police were able to determine that one of the phones and the car was registered to Jaswant Gandam, Samandeep's brother-in-law. Jaswant confirmed with investigators that Samandeep was actually the user of the phone. Another phone in the situation belonged to a John Doe, spelled like cookie dough, but was alleged to have also been used by Samandeep. But the most important piece of evidence was a voicemail. With two Blackberries in his pocket, Samandeep bumped one of them in the chaos of the wreck, causing a pocket Ooh. dial to his own iPhone. Well, that's kind of lucky. <laughs> He then, uh, can you even believe it? I, no. He then left a one minute voice recording at the exact time of the shooting, <gasps> capturing all of it. Oh my goodness. I, what are the, I can't even remember the last time I butt dialed, let alone to myself, let alone a voicemail while I'm doing Insane. something very, very awful. Yeah, usually you check that your phone's off before you do your awful deed. You would think <laughs> if you're like, you know, I think I'm going to go shoot someone. Maybe take the phones out of your pocket. <laughs> I mean, don't, because then we catch ya. It's unclear as to what evidence changed from 2011 to 2018 leading to the arrest or why they took three years to get to trial, all along Samandeep waiting behind bars for his day in court. It was finally time for justice in 2021 when a shocking ruling came in from the <gasps> judge. In hearing a complaint from the defense regarding the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which is like the American Constitution, Justice David Mashura discovered what he called egregious institutional systemic behavior within the investigation and the IHIT unit. Uh-oh, what does that mean? It ain't good. Uh-oh. Going back to 2007, senior IHIT management directed officers to disregard Section 490 of the Criminal Code. The Criminal Law Notebook tells us Section 490 provides for a comprehensive scheme of the management, return, or disposition of items that have been seized. It's basically the rules for how officers can obtain, retain, and eventually return the items that were taken during search warrants. While it has a lot of specific rules, the one that is most important in this case is how long officers can hold on to an item when being used in an investigation. Oh no, is the voicemail going to get tossed? Oh, girl. <laughs> and that time that things can be held is three months. Now, we all know investigations usually take a lot longer than that, which is why the courts and Section 490 allow for extensions. You have to file them, though, right? If after those 90 days you need to hold on to that evidence, in this case, the many phones recovered from the house, then you will need to continue making requests every 90 days until the case is closed or the items are returned. <sighs> So that was what the senior investigators wanted ignored, the three-month limit and the requests. Telling all of their officers, they felt assured there would be no issue with the requests because the lack wouldn't be alarming to anyone. It would just allow them to fly under the radar. When questioned, those senior officers disagreed that their refusal to follow protocol was part of shady police work. They argued that making the requests could possibly allow pertinent information regarding cases to get out, possibly botching entire investigations by alerting potential suspects to the heat that was on them. But the judge didn't care. Not only had they ignored the rules of the criminal code, they had overseased. Once in the House, back in May of 2011, officers had taken every phone in sight, ending up with a pile of nine phones, and they didn't know which, if any, belonged to the accused. That meant they couldn't be sure the phones they had were the ones listed on the search warrant. Since the phones were seized without being part of the warrant, they fell into the 489 section of the code, requiring reasonable grounds when taking items that aren't part of a warrant. The misconduct continued. The surveillance system from the house was never part of the warrant either, so just them looking at it was illegal, let alone taking it as evidence. It was actually the movement of the case from the IHIT team to the unsolved unit that brought this to the judge's attention. The unsolved team didn't play by the same rules. Filing for an extension on the property, red flags went flying when it was realized that this was the first request in six and a half years. That's when it was realized the IHIT team had dismissed the conduct code for over seven years. Woof. Arguments were made. The defense had it pretty easy. 
the cops broke the law. I hit tried to explain. They had changed their ways and would now be following protocol. It wasn't just the phones that had the judge upset. The staff sergeant with I hit expressed confusion regarding the charter. The fact that she was willing to testify she not only didn't know which phone of the nine belonged to Sam and Deep, but grabbed all of them anyway was alarming. Even after seizing the phones, there were no efforts made to determine which one was from the search warrant and which were not relevant to the case and should have been returned. With Sam and Deep's mother and brother in the house during the execution of the warrant, providing phone numbers and answering questions, the team still didn't bother to figure out which phone they should have been taking. That seems so remedial, too. Like, there should be someone on the team who's like a super A-type personality yeah. that runs that kind of shit. That's a really good idea. Like, you're with the police, but you're not a cop. You are a the Q protocol Like a person. QA protocol. Yeah. I think it's really important. And that's kind of why when you go into job interviews and they do like the culture fit and learn yeah. about your learning style and what are your strengths, we should look at things like that. Because that can compensate for maybe a really good detective who doesn't think exactly. about that kind of stuff. That's a really good. I feel like that would make a huge difference. Basically having like HR with you at all times. But having someone that knows the law. That's just like a professional at protocol. Yeah. Even if it were multiple anything. people too. Like you split the protocol yeah. book or whatever. Because it's a wow. lot for a detective to also have to know all of these numbered protocols. Oh, yeah. That's a you lot. You have to know every. And then you have to know that. Not Across dismissing the them from oh, no, no, their no, bad no, no. behavior. But but I've always said that with police. It's like I, you know, my issues with police isn't this like blanket thing. It's like I don't think someone should pull someone over for speeding and then turn around and have to process a car wreck where they see and deal with horrible things and then get a call for finding a body. Oh, you think and it should be more to specialized? Process. Yeah, right? it should be like, you're the car wreck guy. You know yeah. all of that. You shouldn't have to know well, all I of this Well, I think the lines get blurry when they start you know, they don't have the resourcing. Oh, they exactly. Mean. But I think that's a great idea to have someone that it's like you're not there to restrict what the police are doing. You're, you're just there making sure, sure everything's right. above bar. And imagine what that would do for um, for cases. Yeah. To be like, oh, but this person was here who's not related to anything. That being said, isn't it pretty normal for police to have to like retake exams on that stuff? I have. No I mean, idea. I don't know about Canada though, but I'm oh, pretty, yeah. I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure they do that here. That you have to like, yeah, like do every tests couple years you refresh things. or something. Mm -hmm. I would hope so. And it wasn't like the detectives couldn't have updated or revised the warrant if they had felt the other phones were relevant making it clear just how easy that was and how much they didn't care about following the rules, there actually had been a change to the warrant that day. While conducting the search of the vehicle, it was realized the license plate had transposed numbers. So an officer, who was in the middle of a search, left, got the paper corrected, and returned for the search, something the judge felt could have been done after the fact and was seen as a very small technical error. Why was the why did the judge find that problematic that he just wasn't prioritizing? No, because it showed that they realized, OK, on this paper, we switched a number on the license plate. And so we need to go change it, which could but have been done afterwards. But and they're they not do, willing to organize the phone. They didn't do anything like that with the phone. They mm. didn't add the surveillance system to the warrant. And then does that also show like a disparity in the team? Like maybe maybe he cares about that kind of stuff and no one else does. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, he's just they have the one type A guy. Yeah, doing <laughs> license plates. The sergeant continued to out herself as a terrible leader and horrible cop. When questioned, she explained the gathering of all phones, even if they aren't on the warrant, was common practice. She even tried to okay the search of the home surveillance system as an attempt to determine how the device worked, so they knew they needed to search it. Why not just put it on the warrant? But the bad police work didn't end there. While conducting the search warrant, Sam and Deep's mother was placed in the back of a police car without being told her rights or being informed she didn't have to stay there. <sighs> oh my God. Instead, the surely terrified mother sat, simply being told, you need to tell us the truth. The arguments didn't matter. The issue was cut and dry for the judge. The phones, the voicemail, and the surveillance videos were not to be permitted in the trial of Sam and Deep, virtually erasing any chance prosecution would have at winning a case and making seven years of investigatory work moot. The judge knew there would be public outcry, not to mention the heartache for the families of Pava and Manbir, but he also knew protocol was more important. Allowing these pieces of evidence would say to the police, it's okay if you don't follow the rules of an investigation, just get us a prosecution. 
even though it means nearly a decade of cases will be looked at and murderers, rapists, and child predators may very well go free, the process of justice is more important than the perception of it. So now, those cops that didn't want to do extra paperwork and wanted to cut corners or thought they were invincible have thrown away all of their work, all of their co-workers' work, all of the time they missed with their families, all of the time the families of victims lost because of their bumbling investigations. Gone. Nothing. Meaningless. With what appears to be zero evidence, there is no hope for the prosecution they'll be able to put Salmon Deep in prison for the murder of Mambir. Heck, we won't even see a trial to know if he was actually guilty. It seems as though all evidence points to him, so it looks like those detectives will just have to go through life remembering that their selfish, unnecessary, lazy police work let a potential killer roam free without consequence and left a family devastated, a new wife widowed, and a young man with a heart of gold ripped away. Ugh, it's, you know, you have to, though. Like, if you start overlooking protocol and it's then a precedent. You, you, all these bad guys get away or, you know, who knows what's going to happen next. Yeah. You can't be loosey-goosey with that stuff. Yeah, because it, I totally get why he did it. And it's devastating because go to the people in labs that work on it and the people in, like all the people that put time into things and everyone has these rules that they have to work yeah. with and just because the few people that were at the house couldn't correct their paperwork and then couldn't follow the protocol it, nothing what blows my mind too is on a phone like you can see the number usually well if it's an iphone they're like named like mine is right. emily's phone right you know? It just seems so silly. And the family was there. The mom Telling and brother the were names. like, that's my phone. That's my brother's phone. That's our cousin's that's phone. Whatever. That's mind boggling And they're me. just like, scoop. The whole case hinged on that. Mm -hmm. Oh, my and God. And to not just, I mean, and it's of all the work that you do, the fact that for seven years people were looking and they found the guy, which seems totally impossible. And that he had the voicemail. <laughs> and he had a voicemail. I mean, this was a slam dunk case in my eyes granted yep. innocent till proven guilty but as far as the case goes you've got some there was major evidence damning as evidence exactly and they just threw and it in the garbage you couldn't just write a piece of paper you couldn't just and i get there's a lot of paperwork that's the job you know it's like you i'm can't interested be mad. to know what they found in the previous work that they that they had like yeah. all the previous cases this just happened last year so i have a feeling it's gonna come out in the next couple years when things are processed and looked through we're gonna see some people in yeah. canada that are released from jail that probably it, shouldn't be i mean it's understandable if somebody is like hung over and has a bad day and slips up right but for an entire group yeah to just disregard and then and be to have okay your with it. Well, to have your leader. Yeah. Your, if your leader okay is saying, it. hey, guys, it's just a piece She's of paper. She's making them look bad. Saying 90 days like, ah, don't worry about it. We'll just hold on to it. It's like that's your leadership. You can't assign that to you know, it. Like, don't you have an intern or like a rookie cop? And you can say, hey, you're stuck doing this. Well, paperwork. that's the thing. The rookie cop is being trained by them. Exactly. So that it's just a repeated problem over and over. And that might fly with these like non-criminal cases. Right. Or things that are like low level mm -hmm. but when you have a murder case you need protocol and when all of your evidence is affected by this it'd be one thing if oh they had an eyewitness who saw him or uh something else but all the evidence was the surveillance system and mm. his phones and now the, their da equivalent i don't know what they have there right because i've already forgotten but i would be pissed if i was a da oh, yeah. i would be so pissed oh yeah like, how dare You're you? You're like, I'm a prosecutor. You're going to whine at me about paperwork? I would have won this. <laughs> yeah. Because so you idiots and jeez. I, I mean, and I don't know how Canada works as far as plea deals or or things like that. But uh, yeah, I feel like they could have even gotten to the point of presenting what they had and gotten a plea deal. Yeah. To yeah. Be like, OK, 10 years or so. And at least have this person who, by all accounts, drove erratically to get this Lexus's attention cause this little wreck to make them stop so that he'd get out of the car so he could shoot him and drive away. Like, that is so horrifying to me because mm -hmm. there's no... It could happen to anyone. Anyone. There's no, oh, you know, because everyone makes the excuses of, well, she was out late at night or, oh, he didn't lock his door or they didn't... You can make those excuses so you can say to yourself, that would never be me because, of course, I would, you know, not do those things. Whatever you want to tell yourself. But with this, it's like, 
you're going to not drive down the road. You're not going to check your car yeah. uh, when you get an accident. Like, what can you do to avoid that? This is just a monster and he's free and he's just out. Horrible. That's a very, very disappointing case. So <laughs> thanks. Do your paperwork, everybody. No cutting corners. That's right. Classic. Oh, are you leaving? No, no. I'm just putting my sweater on because I got Because you're a cold little baby. Your nipples are hard. Yeah. Always. Like Jennifer Aniston over there. Danish. Mm. We have, what are they? Peach? Pecan? What? Oh, no. This is one I bought at the store. Oh, well, la da We do have some pecan Danishes in the freezer, though, if you want. No, I'm not a pecan person. Yeah, I'm not either. They're desperation desserts. (laughs) Besides a vehicle matching the description, officers found and seized multiple telecommunication. Telecommunication. <laughs> telecommunication. Telecommunication. You want to come over for some telecommunication? <laughs> Delicious. <laughs> Hello, this is Officer Detective, and I'm here for the telecommunication <laughs> with my grandma jewelry. Oh, are you jewelry? <laughs> <laughs> jewelry. Another phone in the stitch. I bit my tongue. Oh no! <laughs> just a little, chihuahua. just a little taste bud on the end. Oh, it's on her all day. Murder in the Rain is a Cascade Media production, written and hosted by Emily Rowney, Alicia Holland, and Josh McCullough. Edited by Josh McCullough. You can always contact us at murderintherain at gmail dot com or through our website murderintherain dot com. If you just can't get enough of Murder in the Rain, for as little as $5 a month, you'll have exclusive access to bonus episodes at patreon.com. You can find us on all of the socials, and for more true crime, follow at M underscore Murder in the Rain on TikTok, and you can also listen to Alicia and Josh on their other show, Always Be My Sisters. And suck my balls. <laughs> <laughs>